Secretaries and Ministers today. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin III, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense for Australia, the Honorable Richard Marles, Minister for Defense for Japan, the Honorable Minor Kihara, and the Philippine Secretary of National Defense, the Honorable Gilberto Teodoro Jr. Each of the secretaries and ministers will deliver opening remarks and then have time to take a few questions. Please note that I will moderate those questions and call on journalists. With that, Mr. Secretary, or Secretary Austin, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Patrick. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Marles, Minister Kihara, Secretary Teodoro, it's been great to welcome you to Camp Smith. And it's been great to be back here in Honolulu. I want to thank Admiral Aquilino and Indo-PACOM for their hospitality on the eve of tomorrow's change of command ceremony. Earlier today, I had the chance to meet with Deputy Prime Minister Marles and Minister Kihara. We discussed how we can deepen our trilateral cooperation to strengthen <coughs> stability and security throughout the Indo-Pacific. And together with uh, Secretary Teodoro, we held an historic meeting to further deepen the defense relationships among our four countries. Just last year in Singapore, the defense ministers from Australia, Japan, the Philippines, and the United States met together for the first time. Today's meeting, the second of its kind, built on that momentum, and it helped advance a vision that our four democracies share for a free and open Indo-Pacific. I'm proud of all that the United States has achieved each of your countries, gentlemen, since President Biden took office. And I'm proud that all that we've achieved together. Just last month, our four militaries conducted a maritime co cooperative activity in the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. This was the second multilateral cooperative activity of its kind in the last 12 months alone. Activities like this don't just strengthen our interoperability, they also build bond, bonds among our forces, and they underscore our shared commitment to international law in the South China Sea. Now, we also talked about the security landscape across the Indo-Pacific and discussed new initiatives to make the region more stable and secure. We're looking to conduct more maritime exercises and activities among our four countries. We also want to pursue coordinated security assistance to the Philippines. That will boost interoperability and help the Philippines achieve its defense modernization goals. So it's been a highly productive day. We've gathered here because we share a vision for peace, stability, and deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. We've chartered an ambitious course to advance that vision together. And that's why today's meetings were so important. So, Ministers, thanks again for joining me here in Honolulu. And Richard, over to you. <clears throat> well, thank you, uh, Secretary Austin, Minister Kihara, uh, Secretary Teodoro. It is a uh, pleasure and an honour to be standing with the three of you here today. Um, we meet at a time when the global rules-based order uh, is under intense pressure. We see that in Ukraine with the appalling invasion by Russia of that country. But we see the global rules-based order under pressure in the Indo-Pacific as well. And a challenge to the global rules-based order in Ukraine is a challenge to the global rules-based order in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, in the West Philippine Sea. And our four countries are utterly committed to asserting freedom of navigation, to asserting the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, to asserting the global rules-based order around the oceans of the world, including in the West Philippine Sea. Our alliance with the United States has been the cornerstone of Australia's national security since World War II. Uh, and today, the security relationship that we have with both Japan and with the Philippines has never been closer. But as close as our respected bilateral relationships are, there is a power and a significance in our four countries acting together. And today, the meetings that we have held represent a very significant message to the region uh, and to the world about four democracies which are committed to the global rules-based order. Uh, in our discussions today, 
we've spoken about an increased tempo of defence exercises based on the reciprocal access agreements, the status of forces agreements that we have between our countries or which are being negotiated. Uh, we have uh, been very pleased to sign the research development testing and evaluation arrangement uh, with Japan and with the United States and this arrangement will uh, see much greater collaboration between our countries in relation to defence science and technology. And we've also discussed ways in which our countries can coordinate more in terms of our activities in the Philippines, which is very important as well. As I said, we are uh, four people who have a very close personal relationship which reflects um, the significance of the relationship between our countries uh, and the determination and commitment that we have as four countries to upholding the global rules-based order within our region and Australia has been very pleased to be able to participate in today's meetings. Uh, finally, can I just say uh, the United States Indo-Pacific Command um, is profoundly important to the national security of Australia, uh, but also the countries of the region. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Admiral Chris Aquilino for his service um, in this command during his tenure of office. He is a dear friend of Australia and we wish him very much the best for his future. Uh, in the same breath, um, I'd also like to uh, say how much we are looking forward to uh, Admiral Sam Paparo taking up his role as the commander of Indo-Pacific Command. I've had the opportunity to get to know Admiral Paparo over the last few years, <coughs> excuse me, and I know that this command could not be in a safer or better pair of hands. And so with that, we wish both men um, all the best for the handover tomorrow. First and foremost, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to Secretary Austin, DPM Marles, Secretary Tojo Teodoro, and everyone involved for your effort to realize this meeting. While the security environment around us is facing even harsher challenges, it is extremely vital for us allies and like-minded countries to cooperate and collaborate with each other. In order to maintain and bolster peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region under such circumstances, it is extremely significant that we are able to hold second meeting of the Japan, um, U.S., Australia, Japan, and Philippine Defense Ministries meeting. And furthermore, to be able to hold the first joint press conference on the Four Nations. We stand by together with all the nations who share common vision of the free and open Indo-Pacific, which is the foundation of the peaceful and stable Indo-Pacific region. Japan I consider it is the most important to maintain and bolster free and open international order based on the rule of law. I express explained the East China Sea situation in the meeting, as well as also issues around South China Sea is the valid interest matters of the international society, including the four nations, which is directly related to the peace and stability of the region. We stand united to strongly oppose any attempt to unilaterally change the status quo of the South China Sea by force or and any activity to heighten the tension in the region. Last month, we had a joint exercise with U.S., Australia, Philippines, and Japan in the South China Sea. And this was the first joint maritime cooperative activities, MCA, by the four nations to strengthen the regional cooperation to realize free and open Indo-Pacific. And at, the, uh, at that opportunity, the four ministers um, who are present today issued a joint statement demonstrated that the solidarity of our four nations to the international society. We would like to continue to pursue the further opportunities of cooperation. Currently, we are under negotiation to reach RAA, Reciprocal Access Agreement with the Philippines. The early settlement of this negotiation will further activate and uh, vitalize the um, bilateral joint 
exercise and training of the Philippines and Japan military units and expected to contribute to the reinforcement of the cooperation among the four nations. Japan. Japan is determined to further strengthen the cooperation of the four nations and will make all possible efforts to secure peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Austin, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Mars, Minister uh, Chiara. Uh, thank you once again for, to uh, Secretary Austin for hosting this uh, historic meeting today. Uh, it comes after the trilateral meeting between our heads of state in Washington, D.C., and in our case, the visits bilaterally of President Ferdinand Marcos to Australia, Japan, and the United States. The, the uh, underlying principle of this meeting is a shared uh, respect for a rules-based international order and the upholding of international law. And it is safe to say that four countries, four independent countries voicing the same message means an important thing in the face of a unilateral declaration by a single theater actor. And this is what perhaps the symbolic suggestion of four defense uh, ministry and the department heads are here today. And in this spirit of upholding a rules-based international order, a free and open Indo-Pacific and upholding international law, we meet here once again today in the latest iteration of a, our four countries multilateral cooperation. We are gratified to see that the Philippines' role as at the forefront of severe challenges to its uh, territori territorial rights, challenging the uh, accepted norms of international law are accepted by like-minded nations. We welcome their partnership and in cooperation, not only to protect solely its territorial integrity and sovereignty, but to uphold, once again, let me reiterate, principles of international law which guide the global order in the proper way that nations should live amongst each other. On a more concrete note, this latest iteration will give birth to further cooperation and coordination and interoperability between four of our countries, which the four of us have committed to work closer together in order to have more synergies and partnerships, in order to make this alliance that we have uh, stronger and more sustainable in the long run. Also, we uh, look forward to concluding a reciprocal access agreement between Japan and the Philippines so that our interoperability quadrilaterally can be in a more uh, complete manner, can be enforced in a more complete manner. Lastly, we thank uh, Admiral Aquilino of Indopecom for his service to the region, and we welcome working with uh, Admiral Sam Paparo. Once again, thank you, uh, Secretary Austin, for hosting us, and we look forward to more fruitful outcomes in the future as we work closer together, not only in terms of our departments, but in true people-to-people -people understandings and exchanges. Thank you. Thank you all, gentlemen. Our first question will come from Phil Stewart, Reuters. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Austin on Gaza, do you have any credible information uh, that Hamas hopes to target U.S. troops building and eventually operating the pier off Gaza? And then a question on uh, the U.S. and uh, Philippines. Uh, to Secretary Teodoro, Given recent clashes with China and the Second Thomas Shoal, do you believe it's increasingly likely that you will need to invoke the Mutual Defense Treaty 
and what kind of U.S. response would you like to see if a Filipino service member is killed? And uh, just to clarify, Secretary Austin, to confirm President Marcos, uh, referring to your comments, um, said it would take the death of a Filipino service member to invoke the treaty. Uh, is that correct, uh, that, you, that you feel that way, and, and what, what makes that threshold the right one? Thank you. Well, thanks, Phil. A um, number of questions in there, so I'll, uh, I'll try to work my way through them. Uh, but first, uh, I think the first question was regarding uh, any credible information that we have that Hamas uh, is going to attack our, our troops. Uh, of course, I don't discuss uh, intelligence information at, at the podium, and, but uh, I don't see any indications uh, currently that uh, there is a an active intent to, to do that. Um, having said that, Phil, this is a, this is a combat zone and uh, a number of things can happen, a number of things will happen. Uh, and uh, the safety and security of our troops is very important to me. And, uh, and so the chairman and I have worked through, have talked with the uh, combatant commander, General Carrillo, a number of times on uh, what measures he's putting in place, he personally is putting in place to uh, ensure that our troops uh, are protected. Uh, and, uh, and so I think he's done a, a credible job of making sure that he has the right uh, uh, means in, in place. Um, our allies are also providing security uh, in that area as well. Uh, and so it, it's going to require that uh, we continue to, to coordinate with them very closely. To ensure that uh, you know, if anything happens, that uh, you know our troops are protected. The second question I think you 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 asked was regarding the, our treaty uh, with the Philippines. Um, you know, we've been very clear to everyone, to include Beijing, that the kind of behavior that we've seen, uh, where. Um, Filipino crews uh, are, are put in danger, where you know troop uh, sailors have been injured uh, and uh, in property damage. Uh, that uh, that's irresponsible behavior, and it disregards international law. So, Phil, I won't get into any hypotheticals on on what could happen and how it could happen. I would just say that uh, you've heard me say, you've heard our president say a number of times that. Our, our commitment to the treaty is ironclad, and we stand with the Philippines. Uh, and finally, uh, let me just say that, as all of us have said, uh, we're doing historic work with the Philippines and helping them uh, modernize their, their military. And it's exciting work, and, and, uh, and we look forward to uh, continuing to make progress. Uh, and today's discussions just highlighted uh, the kinds of things that we need to focus on, that we are focusing on, types of uh, exercises and operations we're going to do uh, to ensure that we increase interoperability. So it's been a very, very fruitful day from, from that, uh, that standpoint. I would like to echo the words of uh, Admiral Aquilino that it would really be uh, counterproductive to delve into hypotheticals. And I, for one, as Defense Secretary, would like to steer away the discussion from a scenario when or in what occasions the MDT may be invoked, when our jobs as secretaries is to make sure that there are no situations through capability building, through deterrence, that an MDT situation would arise. And uh, so we are very conscious of the fact that we need to assert our rights, but in a manner that safeguards the safety of each and every member of uh, the Philippine Armed Force, which is the principal actor in the area. And uh, the talk about MDT sometimes also is exploited uh, in the international press and used sometimes as a bogeyman in order for our countries bilaterally and multilaterally to go forward with legitimate hardening measures for the Republic of the Philippines. So I would stay away from theoretical and hypothetical talks on the MDT because to me these are counterproductive. It is an agreement. 
and it will be a political decision at the end of the day of both go the principally the Philippine government when to invoke it. And I will leave it at that. Thank you, gentlemen. Our next question will go to Tajima Yoshihiko, Asahi Shinbun. My name is Tajima from Asahi Shinbun. I would like to um, ask um, all of you, sirs, um, this is the first time that the Secretary and the ministry, Ministers of Defense of the four countries gathered together um, to make an appearance for the press conference. And having uh, standing side by side for, to hold this press conference like this, what kind of message you could send to China? Uh, uh, is this for all of us? Okay. Uh, I'll start. Uh, in First and foremost, we're here today because we share a common vision, and that vision is a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, and we, we believe that our continued work together will continue to promote uh, activities that, uh, that will help lead to that uh, accomplishment of that vision. Um, and you just heard us talk about some of the work that we're doing together, uh, and I think, uh, I think that kind of work will advance uh, again, our efforts to, to achieve the objective. Now, having said that, we're clear-eyed clear about the challenges that, uh, that exist uh, throughout, the, throughout the region, uh, and, it's, uh, and, and so we'll need to continue to work together uh, to increase interoperability, uh, to make sure that uh, we share information, share intelligence, uh, and, uh, and, and again, I, I think that's the way that you, that you promote uh, uh, security and stability, and, but, but that's why we're here, because we share a common vision. So. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Well, we, in standing here, I think we um, reflect a determination uh, to work as closely as we can together to pursue our objectives. Uh, and those objectives are around what each of these four countries stands for on their own and what we stand for together. Um, and that is, as Secretary Austin has just said, a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, it is the maintenance of the global rules-based order uh, within our region. Um, and we do that as four democracies which have shared values. So that we stand here today is actually about us. Uh, that, that, that is what we are giving expression to uh, in this moment. And I'd make the observation that in um, standing for a free and open Indo-Pacific, in standing for uh, the expression of the global rules-based order in our region, we are standing for what has underpinned prosperity and security within the Indo-Pacific for decades, which has seen this region of the world uh, experience enormous economic growth um, and in many ways be uh, the powerhouse of the global economy and has literally seen millions of people raised out of poverty. Um, that's what this is about. Um, this is first and foremost about what each of us stand for collectively. It is about the way in which we work together and it is about the assertion of a global rules-based order. Um, press conference today, we expressed concerns regarding the situation in East and South China Sea. However, this statement is not directed to, uh, towards um, any specific or particular nation. And um, it is uh, towards the, uh, the nations um, which are trying to um, change the status quo by force. Based on that, uh, it is urgent that the, uh, we strengthen uh, cooperation and interoperability with allies and like-minded countries in order to maintain peace and stability in the Indian Pacific nation. At the last trilateral meeting, um, we were uh, able to agree to promote um, cooperation um, and also uh, in interoperability in the area of the defense and peacekeeping and security. And not too far from, off from the uh, U.S., Philippines, and Japan summit, this time we were able to hold um, this uh, defense ministers and the secretaries meeting and um, also hold this joint press conference today. And I would like to continue sending messages uh, throughout the world that um, us, four nations and governments, gather together um, here today and will be sending um, 
uh, we in hand to hand to continue making efforts to real re to the realization of free and operation um, open Indo Pacific region as well as realizing um, inter uh, orders based on keeping abiding by the rules. Is here have a common understanding of generally accepted principles of international law, UNCLOS, and the need for a global and open Indo Pacific. And this common understanding includes the interpretation of these bodies of law, which are commonly accepted against unilateral appropriations of singular interpretations for the benefit of any one country. For the Philippines, this is particularly important, being a small archipelagic nation where our integrity as an archipelagic country and as a political and legal whole depend on the world's acknowledgement of its baselines under international law. And this is not only a question of legal or political importance, but being a country with a growing population with climate change challenges, this is essential for its sustainability and for the sustenance of our future generations. So generally, we are fighting today for the betterment of future generations of Filipinos. And that is the fight for us, which we appreciate, because it falls under the context of a rules-based international order that the three countries are supporting us in our common quest for already commonly understood definitions of international law, particularly in the maritime domain. This is the message that I interpret this meeting to be. One more question I would like to ask. Um, for Japan, which is um, increasing the um, defense capability, how do you evaluate um, its effort? And then, uh, please tell us what you expect um, you have for Japan in the, the framework of um, these four nations. Also, um, we have another question for um, Minister Kihara. We understand that the very first maritime cooperative activity for U.S., uh, Australia, Philippines, and Japan, and uh, we also understanding that the, there will be more MCA um, or more frequent MCAs, and then uh, with our constitution, and what would you think um, uh, that you can, what you can do, um, what type of activities you can do? to our efforts to defend um, efforts to increase its defense capability um, and I'll let uh, Minister Kiara speak to uh, how they're doing and, and what they're doing what, what I will say is that Japan is a very important ally to us uh, it is a very capable uh, country uh, a proud democracy and, uh, and we have often described Japan as a, uh, our relationship with Japan as a cornerstone uh, to, uh, to our efforts in the region and certainly uh, leads to uh, or contributes to greater uh, security and stability in the region. So um, uh, we're going to continue to do everything that uh, we can to help uh, Japan achieve its goals and objectives. You know, they. Uh, they're looking to further modernize their force, uh, do some things to uh, to uh, restructure their command and control, uh, invest in uh, in new uh, new capabilities, uh, and we're going to help uh, any way we can, every step of the way. Uh, and you 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 saw from the recent summit uh, uh, conducted in Washington, we announced a number of defense initiatives that I think are going to ensure that uh, we're working together with Japan. Uh, to continue to build real, credible uh, capability uh, as far as their defense is concerned. 
Uh, as I said at the uh, outset, we have never uh, been closer to Japan than we are right now um, in terms of the way in which we cooperate on our collective security. Uh, we have a reciprocal access agreement in place which is a step change um, in the way in which we engage with each other in respect of defence and that last year, for example, saw us operate um, F-35s in both of our countries together. Um, and so we welcome um, an increase in Japan's uh, defence capabilities. Uh, we welcome it because we see Japan as a close partner um, with us, but with uh, America, with the Philippines, in contributing to the collective security of the region in which we all live. Um, and from Australia's point of view, um, we, we take the, 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 the position now um, that the, the defence of Australia um, doesn't mean much unless we see the collective security of the region in which we live. And so when we look at uh, Japan making its commitments to increase its capability and working closely with us in providing for the collective security of the region, um, that is a very good thing. Uh, Japan has been a traditional industrial, commercial and tourism partner of the Philippines for some time now. So it is a logical uh, facet of our bilateral relations that uh, we welcome the increase in defense capabilities, particularly in the de technological field of Japan, of which the Philippines can be a partner or a recipient of. Now, for the collective regional question, we welcome the uh, additional capabilities of Japan, because as we said, they are an important cog in our uh, scheme of things, particularly in this uh, uh, quadrilateral summit, in enforcing regional peace in the area. And we look forward to Japan's increasing role, not only bilaterally with the signing of our reciprocal access agreement, but all the resultant benefits that this and other multilateral initiatives uh, will bring to the region. Well, um, that was my question to, about my our, uh, contribution to the um, our role in the framework. Correct? Okay. Um, last month, um, our the four nations had the joint exercise, and today we uh, released a joint statement by four secretary and ministries ministers for who are standing here today. The um, MCA by um, our uh, four countries is an effort that strengthens the international cooperation as, and, and represents our stance that we support and respect maritime rights under the international laws, as such as freedom of maritime activity in, in order to achieve realization of free and open in the Pacific. And in terms of what type of activities that the Japan Self-Defense Force will or may participate in MCA will be considered and determined individually and specifically for each activity. In any case, I would work on deepening um, our uh, commonality in our common tasks and pursue, pursue to have more opportunities of cooperation by four nations, in, um, uh, including MCA. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Our last question will go to Haley Pritzky, CNN. Thank you so much. Um, question for you, Mr. Secretary, and then for you as well, Minister Marles. Mm -hmm. um, Secretary Austin, you've said that you've not yet seen a detailed plan from Israel that takes into account removing civilians from harm in Rafah before an offensive operation. What consequences would Israel face from the U.S. if they moved on this operation without appropriately taking into account uh, those civilians in the area? And secondly, on uh, Niger, it was reported today that Russian troops have moved into an air base that also are housing U.S. forces. Are you concerned about the proximity of Russian and U.S. forces? And what is your message to other countries on the continent who may be eyeing expanding their relationship with Russia? And for you, Minister Marles, um, Australia announced recently another $100 million in aid to Ukraine. After your recent visit to Ukraine, do you believe that that's enough? And it, would Australia be uh, prepared to provide more support, particularly in air defenses? Thank you. Well, thanks, Haley. Um, in terms of consequences, you know, I'll, I won't speculate on what could happen 
uh, which should happen, uh, that will be determined by, by the President. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if we reach a point um, that, we, that something like that needs to happen. But what we've asked, what we've highlighted for the, the Israelis is that um, it's really important to make sure that the civilians that are in that battle space uh, move, uh, move, or move out of the battle space before any activity is, is conducted. Uh, and that uh, when, if and when they return to um, any kind of uh, uh, operation, that it be conducted in a more, much more precise uh, fashion. Uh, they have not yet uh, moved the civilians out of the battle space. As you know, Haley, there were some 275,000 or so peop uh, people that were living in and around Rafa uh, before the conflict uh, started. Now there's 1.4 million or so people uh, there, and, and that's uh, that's a lot of people in a in a very small space. Uh, and uh, again, if uh, there's a good chance that uh, you know without uh, taking the right measures, that the civilians will be uh, you know civilians will see a lot more civilian casualties going forward. So. Before anything happens, we certainly want to see them address that uh, that threat to the civilians, uh, and uh, and and again, we would we would ask that things be sequenced. But you know, right now, uh, the conditions are not uh, favorable to any kind of operation, and we've been clear uh, about that. You know, it's it's necessary to to take care of uh, the the uh, civilians, civilian population that's in that area uh, before anything else happens. Uh, in uh, in Niger, you, you asked about Niger and Russians being in the same space that we're in in Niger. Uh, I think you know that Air Base 101, where our forces is, is a Nigerian uh, Air Force base that uh, is co-located with uh, uh, an international airport in the capital city. Um, the Russians are in a separate uh, compound and don't have access to U.S. forces or access to, to our equipment. Uh, and this is something that... Uh, you know, again, I'm always focused on the on the safety and the protection of our troops. Something that we'll we'll continue to watch. Uh, but uh, right now, uh, I don't see I don't see a significant issue here uh, in terms of uh, our, our force protection. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the question. I was um, uh, very pleased and honoured to be able to announce our most recent package in support of Ukraine, which was uh, $100 million. Uh, but in announcing that package, it is just the most recent package. There will be more. Um, we've made it clear from the outset that we will stand with Ukraine uh, for as long as it takes for Ukraine to resolve this conflict on its terms. And we see this as an enduring conflict where we will need to be standing side by side with Ukraine over the long term, and so that will see future packages, just as uh, there have been previous packages to the one that we announced uh, last week. Uh, but we did see that this was um, a particularly um, precarious moment for Ukraine, and so uh, we felt that it was important on this occasion in announcing the package to do so in Ukraine, and um, I felt very, as I say, very privileged and honoured to be able to make this announcement in Ukraine itself. Um, integrated air and missile defence was a key priority for Ukraine in the conversations that we'd had with the Ukrainian government. It formed about half of the, the package that we announced. I mean, we'll continue to work with the Ukrainian government going forward about what their priorities are and where our support can be best placed. Mr. Ministers, Secretaries, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press briefing. Thank you for joining us today.